it's right slide three and whatever notes you do want to take, but you can match that with what we email you. Okay. So of these, uh, of this number of 61% of men, 51% of women, 8% receive the diagnosis of PTSD, right? Which is both good news and bad news. The the bad news is that wow, that's a lot of people, right? Eight percent of you know, sixty-one percent of men, fifty-one percent of women, receive that diagnosis. The good news is it's just eight percent, right? Which is to say that many people experience trauma, but most people don't uh, don't get the PTSD diagnosis after that, right? Which is to say that we have resilience. We have an inherent way of of working with trauma, and, and so most people don't walk away from these events traumatized. Right? So there, there is good news for that. Um, how many people here have heard of the ACE study? Yeah? Okay, great, great. That's usually, that's usually that's more than what I normally get. Um, so the ACE study is a, a fantastic piece of research that's going on right now. It's sort of the gold standard for um, for research, it's basically a, a, a collaboration between the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser. It's a, uh, it has over 17,000 people in the sample size, and um, you know there are more than 50 journal articles that have been published from this data. Right? And so, um, well, basically, how it started was there was a, a doctor in, in Southern California, Faletti, who basically said, "Wow, you know, um, I'm I'm working with his his population was sort of." Um, uh, the Kaiser population that were obese, and so and he found out that over 50 percent of the people that were his that were his patients had a significant history of childhood sexual trauma, right? And so he thought to himself, "Huh, I wonder if this applies to other areas." And so the ACE study set out to find one thing basically: is there a correlation between childhood trauma or what what they're calling adverse childhood events? Right? And, and adult disease processes, adult mental health processes. Right? And what they found is, is that there's an unequivocal yes. Um, I'd recommend if you, if you go to their website, which is astudy.org, they'll have these sort of these write-ups and these charts that they did. And, and basically, you can, you can see that as a person reports you know, more and more ACEs in their childhood history, the, the, their rates of... Um, you know, heart disease, chronic lung disease, cancer, skeletal fractures, obesity, liver disease, all these bump up correspondingly. There's a, it's a very powerful correlation that they're establishing. Right? So if you want to look at your ACE score and mental health, right? So somebody who has four adverse childhood events has a 460% increase in the likelihood of depression compared to somebody who has none. Yeah. This translates into a 1,220% increase in attempted suicide. Yeah. That was published in JAMA. Um, if you want to look at your <coughs> ACEs and addiction, right? if you have an ACE score of 4 versus an ACE score of 0, that yields a 500% increase in self-reported rates of alcoholism. Yeah. If you have an ACE score of 6, that, that number goes to a 4,600% increase in the likelihood of injected drug use. Um, so this is, these are different researchers. But um, in terms of PTSD and substance use disorders, right? among persons who develop PTSD, half of men, 52% of men, 28% of women are estimated to develop an alcohol use disorder. Right? Uh, that number goes to 35% of men, 27% of women develop a drug use disorder. Right, so there's these very strong ties here with, um, with other uh, issues that take place in mental health. Right? Um, in terms of treatment outcomes, uh, if you have the PTSD, substance use disorder, comorbidity, uh, patients will experience poorer, uh, they're more vulnerable to poor short and long-term outcomes, meaning that relapse rates are higher. It's harder to even get to sobriety if you, if you have trauma along with addiction. Okay. So this is a uh, statement that was put out by the authors of the ACE study. <coughs> right. 
we find that addiction overwhelmingly implies prior adverse life experiences. Right? What they're saying, what they're suggesting is that they are actually arguing against the disease model of addiction. They're saying that the, the correlations between sort of, they're saying that addiction does not take place in a vacuum. Right? The, the pump has to be primed some way for, for people to move into it. They're not arguing against genetics, but they're, they're, they're sort of pushing the idea of epigenetics, that we have certain things that turn on in us given the circumstances, and that can predispose us towards addiction. Right? And by the way, this is, not a <clears throat> this is not a casual, light statement that, they that they're making. Right? These are medical researchers that are looking at hundreds of thousands of pages of patient data to come up with this. And they actually say a lot more, if you want to dive into it. Okay. So, um, and back to that A study that has a you know, 17,000 person sample size, 35% of women had sexual abuse as children. 30% of men experienced physical abuse, and only 32% of participants in a mostly middle class, uh, mostly well-educated population had an A score of zero. Mm -hmm. So in answer to the question of why focus on trauma, well, it's pervasive. Right? Um, in terms of veterans, right? Each day, 22 veterans commit suicide, and we think that's a conservative number. Lifetime PTSD disability benefits can reach $1.5 million per vet. Right, so PTSD trauma is expensive in, in a lot of ways. Um, this is an interesting piece here, and I'm, I'm tempted to remove it, but only because I, I don't remember what the reference is. But it's... Um, Basically, it's some research that, that was done that was su suggesting that in World War II, uh, 15, only 15 to 20 percent of soldiers in trench warfare actually fired their weapon with the intent to kill, right? Meaning that most people experience war and killing as abhorrent, and so uh, we would much rather just shoot our weapon into the air than actually shoot at another person. Um, and obviously, that's not a, an effective way of waging war. And so when, when, uh, in Vietnam, that number moves to 95%, right? Because, uh, well, you can train people to fire their weapon at other people. Uh, so the number moves to 95% of people fire their weapon with the intent to kill, and we're thinking that that has something to do with the, with the m much higher PTSD rates, right? So in other words, you can be shot at or you can shoot at, and either way, you're going to get trauma. Oh, that's small for some reason, but, <laughs> um, you know, I had a, this, this is a quote, um, if you are seeing clients, you are seeing trauma, All right? So it's a quote that uh, a colleague of mine who runs, who's one of the program directors at CEDAR, which is the University of Colorado Hospital's Inpatient Addiction Treatment Center, he used to teach this course with me, and this is one of his statements, right? Just basically, he's saying, look, it's not optional to work with trauma. If you are in the field of mental health, if you are seeing clients, you are seeing trauma. All right. Um, yes? I'm a little stuck on your interpretation of those statistics and I think it's about the different wards. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very big leap that it is a very big leap. people are shooting into the air that are totally different wards. And many, many people in World War II weren't in a situation that's right that's right yeah and that's why I'm a little iffy about putting them in there yeah yeah yes uh, that's actually covered on Dave Rawson's book on killing mm -hmm. and uh, ah. he's talking about um, throughout the progression of war in the military they made targets more and more uh, human uh -huh. and uh, pretty much just training people yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think the st statistics are fairly accurate. Mm hmm Okay. No, I'm not saying that the statistics aren't accurate. Yeah. I'm saying but the interpretation. The support, the fact that maybe they were shooting in the air, there's no real basis for it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, 
when my colleague, who, who's again the program director at Cedar, um, when he, when he got to Cedar, he um, did uh, did some studies, right? He, he basically said, okay, we're we're an inpatient addiction treatment center. How many of the people that come to us every year have trauma along with their addiction, right? And and so he looked at all the the records from 2011 to see what you know what the what the PTSD diagnosis looked out looked like, and would you believe that? Apparently, 0% of the people that entered CEDAR for addiction treatment in 2011 also had trauma. Right? It's not believable because it's not accurate. Right? But what it does do tell us is that the, the field of addictions doesn't know how to see trauma. Right? Um, we know how to see um, anxiety disorder. We know how to see depression. We know how to see bipolar disorder. We know how to see a lot of things that, that people got you know, comorbid uh, uh, diagnoses of, but not trauma. And then he went back in 2012 and gave everybody the trauma symptom inventory, John Breer's test, and the number was 70%. Right. So, what was the number of trauma tests? The trauma symptom inventory, the TSI. TSI by who? John Breer. B-R-E-E-R. Okay. Right, so is that answering the question, why focus on trauma? It's prevalent, it's debilitating. Um, in my anecdotal experience, I think it's why people end up in psychotherapy. Right? I can count on, on one hand people that have entered my office uh, because, you know, um, Actually, I can't count on one hand. <laughs> I was going to say, I can count on one hand people that entered my office, entered treatment that had, you know, a single event trauma, like a car accident, and then they needed to work, or a bad divorce or something like that, and they needed to work something out. Most of the people, I mean, look at your clients, most of the people that enter psychotherapy for, uh, for any real length of time have a, a significant history of childhood uh, disturbances going on, right? Okay. All right, so now we are going to move to memory systems. All right, so again, how we store trauma has a lot to do with how we access it and what we do with it, how we resolve it. Right. So this is um, this pyramid is is designed to just give you a sense of just the different memory systems that we have going on and how much of our person, how much of our character, our day to day. Uh, selves are occupied by any one of these memory systems, right? So the base, the, the, the big one down at the bottom, procedural memory, oh, <clears throat> it's the, procedural memory is the memory of processes, right? It's how you tie your shoelace, it's uh, if you play a musical instrument, right? Language, the fact that we're all English speakers in this room is a procedural process. You learned it at one point. Character, boundaries, right? These are all, all procedurally learned processes. Um, so here, here's a, a quick version of that, right? Which is to say that if you're learning to play the violin, right? And it's your first time picking up the violin, you have to pay a, a great deal of attention to it and focus on it and, and you're obviously not very good, right? But let's say you've been practicing that violin for 15 years, right? You can pick it up, play something, like think about your checking account in your head, have a conversation, right? Basically the idea is that that, that, uh, that ability to play the violin has entered procedural memory, right? Um, I, uh, at, there was a time at which I did not speak English, right? I spoke Hindi in Urdu when I, uh, when I, was, uh, when I was very little. I can't speak those now. Right? Simply because I just haven't practiced it enough, right? So, which is to say that, you know, so this this memory system is non-conscious, right? You don't tell somebody how to play the violin. People have to practice over and over to play the violin, right? It's non-verbal. It requires a great deal of repetition to learn and a great deal of repetition to unlearn. Right? 90 to 95% of character is procedural in nature. 
right? which is to say 90 to 95 percent of everything you do in your your day is proceduralized how you got up this morning you know how you when you drive drove your car here when you tied your shoelaces when all these things are just autopilot right? um, and for a conversation on stress and trauma coping mechanisms are procedural in nature right self-care self-soothing or the lack of self-soothing is procedural in nature. Attachment style is procedural in nature. Right? Um, relapse, right? So in other words, when somebody gets triggered, the fact that they go get blind drunk instead of, you know, go and like take three deep breaths and go for a walk, what they do when they get triggered, that is procedural. Okay? Yeah? So big, big memory system, it's the, the robotic autopilot in, inside of us. Right? It handles a lot of us. Okay, so let's move on to event memory. Right? So I'm going to just read you this statement up here and tell me what you think of. Right? Imagine a plane flying low over a city and its buildings, and imagine it's flying maybe a little too low. What do you think of? Yeah. Does anybody not think of 9-11? Yeah. Where? Taipei. Taipei. Were you in the, in the U.S. when 9-11 happened? Yeah, yeah, but the more recent um, events in Taipei and a plane crash. Oh. Did, did you guys hear that? There was a plane crash in Taipei, and so that's what these guys think of, yeah. right? At the airport? Yeah, that... it was like six months ago. Okay, okay, right. So guys, but think about that, right? Think about your memory of 9-11, right? You, you, I'm, I'm willing to bet you guys can remember uh, where you were when you found out, right? Who told you, whether, you know, uh, you heard about it on the radio or the TV, right? I mean, I can tell you, so I was working at IBM on the diagonal at the time, and I don't remember any of my coworkers from that time, except for this one coworker, because she's the one that opened the door, ran in and said, a plane hit the building, closed the door and ran out, right? <laughs> and, and then I remember being in the hallway and looking up at the monitors, and all the monitors were, were playing this. I even remember the, the beige color of the wall behind the monitor, right? And I'm guessing if you search your memories, you're going to have access to that level of detail, right? Can anybody answer this question for me? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> yeah? Is it because you have the same thing for lunch every day? No. Okay. <laughs> oh, yay, yay. <laughs> That's fantastic. So most people who would be able to answer this, it, the only reason you'd be able to answer it is because either it was really great or you got food poisoning from it, right? <laughs> and the whole idea is that the way that event or episodic memory works is that our minds take a, a visceral snapshot of an image, of a moment where you know, things were either threatening or, or, or significant in some way. So like you know, the birth of your first child will, will be an event memory. Right? Threatening events, unfortunately, will probably fill up event memory much more than sort of highly significant positive events. Right? So what we're saying here is that event memory I don't know why this is all like that, but my apologies for that. Um, capture significant events in a timeless state, positive or negative. It's a different pathway for encoding and storing memories. Um, and this, this memory system is stored primarily as an experiential, a visceral snapshot of the event. Right? So in other words, you can, you can tell us about 9-11 or, you know, that car accident you had or that awesome lunch that you had but fundamentally you are referencing an image right you're referencing visceral data to to then turn into words right so this memory system is not primarily verbal but it becomes verbal if we if we start to describe it right so right can be accessed through verbal means but fundamentally is an image may or may not be conscious this is the memory system that leads to the creation of triggers Right? So, elements of the event, diesel fuel for vets, for example, right, calls forth the entire memory and consequent reactivity. 
right? So think about it, guys. I just gave you a skeletal sentence, right? A plane flying low over buildings. And your mind went through its Rolodex and said, what, am, what, what, what do I have that matches this? And so it, it pulls out this, you know, your mind fills in all the details, right? You can have a little echo and your mind sort of fills in the rest. Um, so that's sort of the, that's how the, the um, triggers work in this memory system. Um, and this, is, this memory system is the one that's primarily responsible for st stress and trauma responses. Okay. So, so then finally, the, the last memory system here, right? Semantic declarative memory. This is the memory system that we're probably most familiar with, right? This is... Uh, this is context-free factual information. That's one of the things that goes in it. It's like, you know, how fast is the speed of light? Right? I, I could tell you, but not because I have any visceral experience with it. I read it in a book. Right? It's also sort of the, the subjective story of what happened. Right? This is the, this is, so you have the thing that happened, the raw experience, and then you have the story that we make around that. We have the, the meaning-making level. Right? So, and everybody gets that that's, when we, when we create a story around something, that that's an abstraction, right? That is a symbolic representation of the story, right? Words are, words are not the thing themselves. Words are only uh, pointing to the thing, right? Um, so, semantic memory is the realm of beliefs. It, it, is, it is verbal, right? It's nothing but verbal. It's mostly conscious. This is the memory system that most of us identify with. Right? This is who we think we are. We think we are our beliefs. We think we are our values. Right? And this memory system is housed in the most recently developed parts of the brain, right? versus sort of the, the other things, that the procedural memory systems and event memory systems. Um, we have those in common with other mammals. Right? Um, semantic memory, we don't. This is, this is uniquely human. Okay. So, um, going back to the slide here, and we, so the, the point of this is saying that, look, trauma affects all of these memory systems. Right? And we have to, when we're working with trauma, we have to work with all of these memory systems. Right? So, for example, let's start at the top of the pyramid here with uh, semantic memory. Right? So this is the realm of talk therapy. Right? Insight, self-awareness happens up here. Um, step work that happens up here when you're doing inventories. Right? It's happening up here. Uh, life coaching, cognitive therapies happen up here. When, when, you, when you're talking about sort of distorted schemas and belief systems that are causing people suffering, this is the memory system we're talking about. And of course, they're, they're all connected. Right? Uh, if we go to event memory, this is the realm primarily of the body, right? This is the realm of the autonomic nervous system, which we're going to dive much more fully and heavily into. Um, experiential therapies are great here. Gestalt, somatic therapies, EMDR, right? These all work with event memory. And then finally, procedural memory, right? So, again, this is the least conscious memory system. So these, and, and it's based on just, it's, it's classical conditioning. Right? So behavioral approaches work here. DBT skill development. Right? DBT is not a processing model. Right? You're not connecting the dots of what happened or anything like that with DBT. You're just sort of repeating skill sets. You're, you're developing auto-regulation with DBT. Um, 90 meetings in 90 days, you know that, that the famous 12-step thing? Um, that is a procedural intervention. Right? It's saying that, like, Look, when you used to get stressed, you would get drunk, right? So for now, just, you know, every day, just go to a meeting, go to a meeting, go to a meeting. And the idea is that on the 91st day, if you get stressed, you're much more likely to go to a meeting than you are to do what you used to do. Um, sponsorship, meditation, right? Meditation is nothing but procedural memory, right? So it's saying go sit on that cushion for... And maybe in 20, 30 years, your monkey mind will be calmed down a little bit. You'll have some, some way of working with it, right? It's not big insights. It's just repetition, right? And so regula oh, regulation skills. 
And so, guys, the, the point of this is, again, we're just saying the right tool for the right job. Right? We're finding if, if people are very activated in their event memory, then trying to talk to them is not very useful. Right? If, you, if people have activation in one particular memory system and you're approaching, their, you're approaching them with a tool from a different memory system, it's not going to be very effective. So the other piece to the slide is that the, the, the suggestion here is that stress and trauma are bottom-up processes. Right? I don't know if you're familiar, if you've been, that, that term's becoming more and more in our culture, but the idea is that, um, you know, uh, uh, cognitive therapies are top-down approaches. You know, we're, we're taking the, the most recently developed part of the brain, the conscious, rational mind, and saying, okay, let's, you know, go in and see if we can work with the, the, the reactivity in the system, right? Um, and we're suggesting that stress and trauma symptoms are fundamentally bottom-up. Right? Okay. Um, so let's talk, let's combine sort of memory systems with phases of trauma treatment. Right? So um, the first phase, and this is, this is true of trauma dynamics, this is true of pretty much any trauma modality out there, right? Which is that the first phase of all of these are, is, is resource establishment, I mean, whatever you call it, right? Um, so it's basically we're talking about establishing a calm resting place within a person's life, right? And so for everybody in this room, you know, if you're functional, if you've been to graduate school, you have the ability to resource, right? But if you think about your clients, if you think about sort of people that have just grown up in, in sort of, that have grown up in hell and didn't have a childhood where they experienced that calming, you know, from, from parent, um, if you think about people that end up a lot of times at, at state mental health agencies because they're, they're so reactive they can't hold a job down, things like that, right? Um, the, these people have very little ability to resource in their life, right? It's a new thing for them, so it's, it's huge. Um, we're helping clients develop their own ability to shift out of activation and shift to calmness. It's auto-regulation, so it means that it's repetition. <coughs> and guys, so let me give you a quick image for this, right? So imagine a balancing scale, right? And on the one hand, you have all the, the, the traumas and places of alienation and uh, isolation and rejection and, you know, all, all that stuff uh, is on this side, right? And on this side are your resources, right? All the places that you feel safe, all the places that you feel loved and connected to, to yourself, to other people in the world, right? And the idea is that if there's some balance between these two sides, then you can do work, right? People are functional if there's some balance between this, right? Most of the time, the, I would say this is even true in a private practice context, but most of the time people are heavy on the trauma side, very light on the, the resource side, right? It's most of the people come into therapy like this. And certainly, if they, if, even if they do come into therapy like this, uh, when you start doing trauma work, they'll end up looking like this, right? So what we really want to do is balance that equation before we go into any other phase in, the mo uh, in, in trauma therapy. Right. Yeah? How many therapy sessions do you guys do before the next one? Do we do three. That's right. So, um, do you spend much time developing your coping skills in the preparatory sessions, or do you just find it just <laughs> You were jumping ahead, <laughs> my friend. Uh, no, w that's one of the beauties of MDMA, right? So this, this whole thing that I'm describing right now, that, guys, this can take a significant amount of time for people that have just procedurally never experienced resource, right? Like, if... And if, if you're always like this, if, you, if your childhood was like this, it's very difficult to get a, any work done. And, and right, the, one of the big ways that MDMA works is it does this, right? Even temporarily, but allows people to, to process intensely when they're doing this, right? And by the way, if somebody is like this naturally, right, where resource heavy, trauma light, guess what? You're not gonna see them, right? You're not gonna see them in therapy. 
These are the people that, you know, 8% of people are, receive the PTSD diagnosis out of all those people that get trauma, uh, that experience trauma. Those people probably who don't get the PTSD diagnosis probably started life like this or someplace in the middle. Right? Yeah. It's common enough. The question was, what, how often does it happen where p patients come in and if you do a tra trauma resource inventory, that they'll say, there's nothing. There's nothing good in my life that I can, that I can call on. It's, it's not that uncommon. It's not that uncommon, but yeah. I'd also add to that that like, sometimes they're just not aware of things that are actually resources. That's right. Resources, and so sometimes it's like, all of a sudden, like, there it is, mm -hmm. and they're not even aware of it. Yeah. No, so, p p yeah, part of the deal is their experience is that there was nothing good and there is nothing good. Uh, life is a, a, just a war zone that I live in. And the fact is, if that were, if that were true, they, they wouldn't be alive, right? So we're, when we're training therapists to work with this, that we're saying, okay, hold their experience and at the same time hold your stubborn ground that there's got to be something in there for them. And if they really say there's not, then the point is of this phase of therapy is to create it. Right? Create a stable ground that people can live in. Okay. Um, and again, this is you know we'll we'll get to it in the second half of the day. But this is a big place that MDMA just does wonders. Okay. Okay. Phase two. This is uh, this phase is specific to to trauma dynamics. Oh oh, I'm sorry. Real quick. So uh, resourcing is both procedural and event, right? Meaning that you have to do it over and over and over again to train somebody's nervous system to go to a good place, right? Because they have a lot of training to go to to really rough neighborhoods. Right? <clears throat> um, so phase two, ego function development, right? So guys, we we put this in here because we just found that that we found two main skill sets that people with trauma almost always had disturbed, right? And one was the ability to draw a boundary, right? The ability to say no, the ability to, uh, to just draw a line in the sand and expect that it'll be respected, right? So um, that's typically disturbed, and the flip side is the ability to trust, right? So basically, so with, this phase, we're working with core non-conscious ego functions that were never developed in their family of origin, right? So in other words, you know, you have a, um, you have a super stressed family, right? F financially stressed, and then, you know, kids hit the, that terrible two where they, they don't want their peas and they want to dress themselves and they want to do this and they want to do that. So, you know, kids are profoundly inconvenient. Right, and so, and if you're, if you if you are a resourced family, you can deal with that inconvenience. You can say, oh, okay, I got space, I got room for this, right? And kids push into their autonomy to become who they are, right? But if you don't, if you're stressed to begin with, and your kid tries to, you know, sort of express their willfulness, uh, and you, and you lose it, right? Or you you break contact, or you go cold, or you get angry, right? What that will the message that sends is wow, it's really not okay to have my, my boundaries. It's not okay to, to, to be me right now. Right? So that's a case in which that boundary development, the ability to say no, never got established in a particular family. Right? Um, so, so we practice that with clients. Right? We practice what we call no work. Um, and what this can look like, they do these groups at Cedar that are just based on saying no and yes, which... To your semantic mind, this doesn't make any sense, right? Of course I can say the word no, right? But if you take somebody who has addiction and you have them sit down, track their body, imagine somebody in their life that they want to draw a boundary with, have them say no to that person, I will guarantee you they go into a, at least a stress response. Right? It's uncanny. We, we, we haven't seen this not happen, <laughs> right? Um, right, so that's the... You know, I mean, think of it this way as well, right? That every trauma is a violation of no, right? For every trauma, car accident, abuse, whatever we want to call it, in some way or another, we're doing this to it. We're, we're trying to block it from happening. And it didn't work, right? Because if it did work, it wouldn't be a trauma. Right? And so 
the other way that it gets disturbed is like, you know, let's say, you know, the, the time that you tried to prevent something from happening, you, that no fail view, and then the times after that, that ability to say no becomes associated with failure, right? In other words, it becomes tainted and we say, oh, that didn't work last time, so I'm just going to kind of kind of avoid it, right? And so it can also, it's an it's a ego function that degrades with trauma. It's like you broke your arm and so you're not going to use that bad arm, you're going to use your good arm, and over time, if you don't use it, it just continues to degrade. Um, I had a client, um, this was a couple of years ago, where this person grew up in the caretaker function in, in, in their family, right? So no ability to say no, like this is the yes person in their family. And so this person's describing to me an experience that they had where they went to a um, seafood restaurant, had really good rapport with their waiter, <coughs> and then the, the <coughs> their fish came out. And so, uh, and, and he said, well, clearly the the fish was bad, right? It was, it was just like bad, bad fish. And then this was the next phrase that came out of this person's mouth, right? So after I finish eating the fish, right? <laughs> and so, <clears throat> and so I, I was like, wait, 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 what, what happened? How, how? And well, he's like, well, I, I didn't want to offend the waiter, oh right? And it, of course he threw up all the way home, right? That kind of thing. But, but, to, but to him, I want you to just see how this, this this procedural process of the inability to say no was just operating for this person and yet their semantic mind didn't think anything weird about it. Okay. And um, personally speaking, I can tell you, I grew up in the reverse of that, right? which is to say that when I was first learning this work in 2003, I found that, wow, no, I, this is great. I can say no all day long. I could say no to any situation and I wouldn't experience stress. Right? And I thought, like, okay, this is, this is fantastic, right? And so the, the instructor who was leading the course came up to me and said, well, what does the other side look like? <laughs> right? I was like, what other side? <laughs> and, was, and he was like, well, what does the side, what, does it, what is it like for you, you to say yes to people? You know, what is, so remember, the flip side of this, of what we're working with is one side is saying no, the other side is saying yes, right? Tr in other words, boundary responses on the one hand and then trust responses on the other, right? attachment. So when this instructor came up to me and asked me that, I was like, I, I don't know. Um, let me think about it. And so I, I, I actually said this phrase to him. I was like, I can't think of anybody in my life that I would ever say yes to. Right? Not girlfriends, not parents, not family members, not anything like that. And I was, I was at Naropa at the time. I was in graduate school for psychotherapy at the time. And this did not occur to my mind as being strange. Right? I'm telling you, this is the limitation of semantic mind that we're talking about here, right? If you grow up in a particular world, so I mean, think about where this might come from, right? So if you, have, if you just had really poor attachment, if there was chaos or violence in your family, what in your experience says, yes, I'm going to let these people in. I'm going to trust. I'm going to say yes to the world, right? Nothing. There's nothing procedurally that tells you you should be doing this. It's a bad idea <laughs> at times, right? But of course, it's, uh, it's, it's necessary for therapy, right? I would say that the ability to draw boundaries is essential for processing trauma, right? But the ability to say yes is essential for living a good life. Right? What else are we doing in therapy other than finding ways of saying yes? Um, and again, one of the one of the realms where MDMA is is fantastic. So just we're sort of bookmarking little pieces here, of saying that oh, this is what it looks like in regular therapy, and this is what it looks like with MDMA. All right? Okay. Um, right. So that's phase two, and what we find is there's there's not a whole lot of like insight work that happens here, but people's lives get better. Right? People, uh, people just learn to say no. I mean, think about it. If you're coming out of a, uh, a, an addiction treatment center, uh, you're going to have to say no to a lot of people in your life. Right? You're going to have to learn to say no to friends. You're going to have to learn to say no to you know, people you bought from. You're going to have to learn to say no to your own impulses. Okay? All right. Uh, phase three of the trauma dynamics model is trauma history. 
And you may be thinking to yourself, huh, we've, these are two significant phases and we really haven't gotten a full sense of their, our client's trauma yet, right? And, and th there's a good reason for that because taking a trauma history is really destabilizing for people. Right? Um, so basically we want an inventory of all the stressful and traumatic events in a person's life. Um, and guys, we're not just looking for a list here, right? We actually want to develop a treatment plan from this, a strategy from this. And to do that, we want to know where does a person go? When they're talking about that bike wreck that happened to them or you know, this chronic abuse situation that happened to them, do they get anxious when they're talking about that? Or do they flat out dissociate? Right? So in other words, we don't want their semantic interpretation of what, how bad this was. Right? We don't want their sud scale interpretation on a one to ten of how bad this was. We actually want to see what does their body do when they, when they, when they recount this, this event. Um, right? So this is not self-report. This is just saying, wow, this person's talking about this and they're completely blank. Okay. Um, so the fourth phase of the model the, the actual processing phase, I'm not going to talk about right now because that's what the whole rest of up until lunch is what we're going to be talking about. Okay? Uh, phase five is integration, right? It's, this is semantic memory, yay! <laughs> Why we went to graduate school. Um, so this is where the cognitive restructuring comes in. This is where the new story, new belief systems, new schemas for self and other, Right? This is where we connect the dots. This is where we say, oh, yeah, that, that theme reminds me of this, the this thing that happened. And so, you know, this is the realm of meaning making. Right? And so, and guys, what we find is that people naturally move into this, right? When they're processing at sort of the deeper non-conscious levels, at, at, w after, after a particular process, which you'll see later, later today, they, they, people naturally move into the storytelling, the, the, the meaning-making phase of this. Right? So we typically don't have to train therapists around this at all. Right? Um, and what I want to say about this is that this, these aren't hard and fast phases that people go through. They'll move through them. They'll go backwards through them. There'll be times when you know, they'll, they'll be in phase four doing some really intense processing, and then they'll have to go back to resourcing things like that, right? So it's a very fluid process. And, you know, people can move to sort of phase five, the integration phase, just at the end of a session, right? So just saying there's, there's fluidity in the system. And then finally, it's not a phase of therapy, but it's something that's happening throughout all of these phases, right? Which is that all of this, everything we've talked about so far, takes place within a relational container. Right? It's bet between the client and therapist. So traumatic transference is almost always active, if not overt. And so here's what we mean by that. Right? So if you have a car accident from which your client, ex you, know, you or your client experienced trauma, right? the, there's less likelihood that that car accident, a single event trauma, will, yield, will lead to traumatic transference simply because you didn't fundamentally have relationship with the people that, that, the, that were involved in the, in the accident. Right? Um, it's just, you know, there's, there's processing that you have to do to, to heal from that. But when, um, if you're talking about trauma that happened in a person's family of origin, right, where the people closest to them on the planet were inherently part of the trauma, then r relationship needs to be part of the processing. <coughs> right? um, how many people, if you think about your clients, right, how many of them are people that, you know, everything was good and fine throughout childhood, and then maybe when they were like 20 years old, they had a, <coughs> a bad surgery or a car accident or something like that. Right? So in other words, a single event trauma. How many people, how many of your clients actually fit that, that bill? Right. Very few, right? Same here, right? I can think of in sort of, you know, 10 or 11 years of private practice, I can think of, you know, maybe three or four people that, that fit that, right? For the most part, it's people that have had repetitive family trauma that, that happens. And so when you're working with that, 
you're inherently working with traumatic transference. Okay. Okay. So we are diving into the body here. Okay. Guys, feel free if you need to you need a break, want to get more food, just you know, get up and stretch. Um, so what is the role of the body in all this? Right? So remember, we talked about procedural memory, event memory, and semantic. Right? And then, of course, there's executive function on top of it all. Right? But, but essentially, if we're talking about event memory, right, it, event memory will create a response in the autonomic nervous system. Right? So past events will feel like anxiety, fear, tension, irritation, depression, hopelessness, numbness in the present moment. Right? So in other words, past events will give symptoms in the present moment. But, so, I don't know why this is getting cut off, but what is the autonomic nervous system? Right, so let, let me sort of d try and detail it this way, right? So right now you guys are sitting there, you're listening to this lecture, your semantic minds are trying to wind and understand what I'm talking about right now, but at the same time that you're doing that, your heart's beating, right? Your blood pressure's being regulated, your body temperature, the amount of oxygen in your blood, um, the, the dilation of your pupils relative to the amount of light in the room is being regulated for you, right? If you had a bagel, you're digesting that bagel, right? Literally, there are thousands and thousands of physiological functions that are going on inside of you right now that you're not aware of, that you don't have to think about for it to happen, right? They're just automatically happening, right? These things, they're, they're, these things are keeping you alive and you don't have to pay them any attention. Right? Your, your, your heart beats without you thinking about it. Right? And so that is the autonomic nervous system. Right? It controls heart rate, breathing, metabolism, temperature. It's a huge chunk of your experience is controlled by your, your ANS. Right? Um, and for a conversation on stress and trauma, there are two sub-branches of the autonomic nervous system that we're really concerned with here, right? One is the sympathetic nervous system, right? This is the fight or flight response. This is that feeling of dread and anxiety you can get in your gut when, when something, you know, something scary is going on in your life, right? Um, and the other, the flip side of the coin is the parasympathetic nervous system. Right? So this is, parasympathetic responses are sort of calming responses. Right? Sleep is a parasympathetic response. Um, if you have insomnia, you know how magical <laughs> you know, sleep can be when, it, when some, for some reason it turns on and other times it turns off. Um, dissociation, numbness, numbing is a parasympathetic response. Right? So if you're getting the picture here, the takeaway here is that Look, we, we identify, again, with our minds, with our, with our values, with you know, our thoughts about the world. And the science is suggesting something very different. The su science is suggesting that so much more of who you are, so much more of, of what comes together to form you is not our non-conscious sort of, you know, uh, uh, non-conscious operating instructions, right? They're, they're procedural in nature. They're autonomic in nature. Okay. So this is perhaps one of my favorite slides in, in this uh, presentation, right? And if you can't see, there's a, a cute little baby down here. Right? And so this is saying that all mammals share the same basic autonomic nervous system setup. Right? And we know this because, well, you can look at any, you can look at mammals and we all have the same basic responses to stress and trauma. Right? So, which is to say that, you know, a mouse does not need a uh, higher level co cognitive functioning to be stressed or traumatized. Right? It doesn't need a story about itself. It doesn't need to, you know, it doesn't need a, a schema. It doesn't need anything. You can, a mouse can be traumatized like a little baby without having higher or order functioning. Right? So, which is to say that 
we are, when we're talking about stress and trauma, we are talking about like a basic foundational piece here. In the biopsychosocial pyramid, or uh, triangle of mental health, we're really talking about the bio here. It's more focusing on the bio, I should say. Okay, so let's go ahead and map it. So this is, that's a lot of background information, right? And now we're gonna give you sort of the map that, that they're gonna, that this is a very useful map that they're training phase three um, therapists with, right? So first key, key point here, right? Stress and trauma symptoms are adaptive. Right? They're intelligent survival responses to threats. Right? Mental health symptoms such as anxiety, irritation, hypervigilance, anger, depression, hopelessness, these are not random. This is not just some random bit of craziness that, that our clients have, or we have, right? These are not nonsensical. Um, symptoms make sense, or I should say they made sense, right, in any other context, and that context is one of threat, right? Um, that context is typically childhood, even if it's not remembered. Right? So what we're basically saying is that threat equals activation of the nervous system. It's sort of the most basic <laughs> thing here, right? The greater the threat, the greater the ANS response. So it can look something like this, right, if we put it on a chart. So um, we have activation over here, and then we have threat level over here, right? So basically, we can put anything in here for threat, right? We can put in car accidents, we can put in abuse, we can put in neglect, we can put in, you know, walking down the street and tripping, right, anything. So, but let, let's put in something that um, we're all pretty familiar with, right? Well, let's say you're driving on the highway in, in Colorado and it's snowing out, but it's, you know, everything's okay. You're listening to your NPR on the radio and everything, you know, you're relaxed, right? And so, um, but let's say you're driving along and you hit that patch of ice, right? For a second there, you know, you have that sense of, wait, wait, my steering's not doing anything here and I can't slow down. So when you hit that, the threat level has gone up, right? Basically, you're in, you're, you're in um, you may lose control of the car. So your nervous system responds, responds right? So in the, in the instant that it happens, you become super tight, you grip the steering wheel, you're, you can feel your heart beating in your chest, right? Adrenaline just gets released into your system. This all happens in a fraction of a second, right? And it, it's perfect, right? So basically, your, your nervous system says, well, you're in danger, so it tightens things up. It, it, gives you a, it, it gives you a sympathetic jolt to deal with the threat. And so, you know, you're, you're not paying attention to the radio anymore, right? So you're hyper-focused, and you realize that, let's say, boy, if I, um, if I drive home more slowly, then I'll be fine, right? So let's say you, you, you slow down, you get, you, you get home, you're safe and sound, right? So eventually, so the threat level goes down to zero, Right? You're safe and sound, and eventually your, your nervous system starts to relax. Your, your shoulders unwind, you, the adrenaline leaves your system, all of that happens. Right? So no big deal. This happens to us a lot. And guys, again, we can, I mean, think about, like, you know, again, walking down the street, you're, you could be on your cell phone and you trip, right? And in that moment of tripping, again, the threat level goes up. You're about to wipe out, right? And think about what your nervous system does to, to prevent that from happening, right? Your nervous system basically, again, adrenaline gets released, your legs get tight to brace you, your arms may come out like this, your core muscles are balancing you, right? Think about the complexity of what your body does to prevent you from falling. Right? We, we can barely build robots that do that. Right? It's incredibly complex, and if you had to run that series of things through your semantic mind, you would fall every time, <laughs> right? If you had to sit there and say like, oh, I'm tripping, I better do this, and I think about this, and things like that, you would fall every time. So this is just to say like, look how thoroughly and profoundly your autonomic nervous system turns on to save you, right? So it's a very powerful force that, for the most part, we're not aware of. It's amazing. All right, so, but, <clears throat> so a, a useful way of thinking about this is that, you know, think about your nervous system like a marble on a track, 
and it's being acted on by gravity, right? So, which is say that it wants to return to the most calm, relaxed position it can possibly achieve, right? And this is because ANS activation is a state of tension, right? It requires biological energy to maintain. And so, basically, we're saying that if the threat level really is at zero, the organism doesn't want to, to expend energy, doesn't want to maintain tension and contraction to, to, to keep that marble up there, right? So everything wants to sort of roll back to state zero, right? Think of it like a marble. Now, the system's more complex than, than what we just put up there, right? Um, and this is from sort of great research that's been coming out for a while now, but the ANS can retain activation even when the threat has passed, right? So this is due to attractor states or resting places built into the nervous system, and it looks something like this, right? So what we're saying is state zero, right? That's where we start. Everything's okay here. State one is a resting place, right? The, it's, it's, a, it's a stable uh, spot in the nervous system that wants to hold the marble. It can hold the marble, and, but it's fundamentally more activated than state zero, right? So let's switch um, analogy. Let's switch examples here and go to a, a mammalian example, right? Let's say we're all zebras and we're sitting out, we're on the Serengeti Plain and we're chewing our grass and it's a, it's a wonderful day, right? So that's what, that we're at state zero. And, and then we hear some rustling in the bushes. Right? And so when you're in the wild, rustling in the bushes can be uh, the wind or it could be a predator, right? And so what initially happens is we get what's called an orienting response, right? So we do this all the time, right? Let's say you're crossing the street and you hear a car horn. Right? Your system orients to it. Your, your neck muscles, everything, just go bing, right? And you, uh, you do that to assess the, the threat level. And if the car is like a couple of hundred feet away or something like that, you don't think about it and you keep walking, right? And so as, as zebras, when we hear the rustling in the bushes, we have the orienting response here. And if it is just wind, then the nervous system says, oh, okay, great, I can move this back down to zero, right? But let's say a couple of hours pass and there's more rustling in the bushes. And this time we look over and it's a lion, right? But she's far away, you know, the bushes are far away, and we see that she's stalking us. So whoever sees her first sends out the signal and, that, and the whole herd becomes more activated, right? And so basically, this is the point of state one. It's, it's state one is saying, be on alert, there's danger around here, but it's not imminent. You don't have to do anything about it yet. Right? Just be hypervigilant. Right? So state one is mild stress. Right? It's relatively stable, attracts and holds a marble, and here are the symptoms of state one. Right? So increased energy, fear, anxiety, anger, hyperalertness, excitement. Right? State one could be an exciting thing. People do like to live in Manhattan. Right? People do like to jump out of airplanes for some reason, a perfectly good one. Um, irritability and annoyance, increased heart rate, breath speed, insomnia, very common at state one. Right? If you're hypervigilant, it's a good idea to not fall asleep. Um, somatic tensions, right? tight muscles, headache, pain, sensations of heat, restlessness or feeling fidgety, speedy thoughts, feeling nervous. Did you remind you of yourself or clients? <laughs> so I, I would argue that most, people, most Americans, we live our lives in state one. It's not bad. It's just, you know, it's a stress state. And so, I mean, one way to think about this, guys, state zero is Hawaii, right? State zero is a great vacation. And you're out and you're like, oh, I want to eat. And you just pluck a mango off of a tree. I have a very interesting idea of Hawaii. But, um, and state one is, is Manhattan, right? It's more active. It's more... Uh, you know, you, you have to um, be activated to navigate the crowds and the subways and things like that. Okay. Um, okay, great. So let's continue with the map. So that's state one, right? But at some point, the line who's talking us will figure out what she's going to do and make her move, 
right? And when she takes off, you guys have seen this in National Geographic, right? When she takes off, we take off. So basically, at that moment, everybody in the system, lion and zebras, we all move to state two, which is maximum activation, right? Maximum fight or flight. This is high stress. And we call this, we call this a semi-stable state, right? So we're drawing it as a flat line and not a trough because it doesn't hold the marble of the nervous system, right? We're saying that, look, when, when, this is, when we're expending this much energy, it's a sprint, right? And, and if you've ever seen that, that National Geographic, uh, you know, the lion will sprint and um, either get her prey or not in 30 seconds, but the, but the, but the chase will be over. Right. So these are the symptoms of state two, high stress. So, um, so this is where panic attacks happen. Right. This is hyper. I'll have ca uh, clients sitting on my couch that that are processing state two, and they're moving into hyperventilation. They're moving into sort of all these responses: heart racing, sweating, shaking, trembling, overall body tension. Um, so think about state two as the, the, the max version of state one, right? This is the maximum sympathetic arousal that, that our systems get to. So this is where we get rage. This is where terror happens. Um, in state one, you'll have anger. Here you'll have rage. In state one, you'll have, you know, fear. Uh, and uh, here you'll have terror. Um, maximum performance, very fast thoughts. Again, does not last very long, right? People are deathly afraid of having a panic attack, but if they actually were to go into it, they last about 30 seconds. Okay. Any questions so far about what, what's happening with this map and sort of the threat responses that the nervous system mounts to, to danger? Okay. Yeah. Um, and guys, I, so we think that there are really good um, reasons why this exists in the system, right? So again, if once that line takes off and we all go to state two, it's much easier to move to state two if you're already hypervigilant than if you're just completely relaxed, right? So think about the zebra that didn't get the memo that there's a line, right? And the zebra's hanging out down here, state zero. Who do you think the line's going to go for? All right. Speaking of the question, is there kind of a continuum within state one? It seems like, you know, you were saying a lot of this function in state one is mm -hmm. the US culture in general, but it seems to me like you can kind of be at this end of stage one or this end of stage one. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's gradations and there's different ways that people handle stress. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, guys, this is a, a rough map, right? It's it roughly predicts states that people will move into and out of, right? It's not, don't, don't hold it too tightly. Okay, so let's move on. We're gonna about, so we're suggesting to you, this is a, a definition that we have of trauma, and we think there's a good, good reason to define it this way, but our suggestion is that everything that we've talked about is stress or high stress and not trauma, right? So, I mean, so, we're, so, which is to say that we're suggesting that stress equals activation of the fight or flight, the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. We're suggesting that trauma emerges at a very specific point. Right? Trauma emerges with the overwhelm of the sympathetic. Right? When, fight, when active fight-flight responses fail to resolve a threat, i.e., when your active solutions fail, the system engages passive solutions. So this is where a massive parasympathetic response emerges. This is where the body begins to shut down. Dissociative responses happen here. This is where we, you start to get fragmentation. Parts develop. And it looks something like this on the map. All right, so let's say we're, we're that zebra, right? We're r running, state two, darting, kicking, biting, doing everything we can to get away. And let's say... For one of us, it's not working, right? The line is gaining, right? So there is some point where the nervous system just says, 
look, I'm, it doesn't look like I'm going to make it. Right? And I don't, again, don't mean that in a cognitive way. I don't mean that in a semantic kind of thought process way. I mean that in a much deeper sort of gut knowing that I'm giving it my all and it's not working. Right? So when we hit that overwhelm point, then the, the symp parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and we go into collapse. We go into depression. Right? We go into what we call state three, moderate trauma, when, and here are the symptoms of it. So we have lethargy, sleepiness, heaviness, collapsed posture, lessening muscle tension, fogginess and dissociation, um, sensations of weight, right? People will sit there and say, like, God, my arms feel like they're made of lead, or my legs and my head feel incredibly heavy. Um, people will actually begin to feel cold because blood flow patterns are changing in the body. Nausea is very common here. Confusion, right? So whereas all the other states one and two have fast, speedy thoughts, right? This is slow uh, uh, cognitive process. Um, suicidality is quite common in state three. And then hopelessness is, I've never ex worked with a client with, who we're working state three trauma with, and they haven't, they don't, they all have pretty profound hopelessness. Right? You have to process hopelessness. A sense that, especially if it's from childhood, a sense that this has been here forever, it will always be here forever, forever. it's never going to change. Right? Um, and, and guys, an important element of state three is what we call dual activation. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, no, you can. Well, <laughs> you can't measure suicidality in, in a mouse, I don't think. But um, but no, we we're still uh, we're overlapping now. Okay. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean heaviness, collapse, posture, lessening muscle tension. That that happens with mammals. Yeah. Um, and and again, think think about the adaptive response here, right? So. These are what are called dual activated. So in other words, um, here. OK. So what we're saying with dual activation is that all the anxiety, all the tension, all the active activation that's been happening here is still there, but it's being muffled. It's being covered up by sort of a much more powerful sort of depressive numbing response. right? And what you can have is you know, feel both at the same time, or they can alternate you know, going, going back and forth between, between activation, hyperarousal, and hypoarousal. And if you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that sounds like bipolar disorder. Yes, it does, All right? Which is one of the big pitfalls, All right? So um, if, pe if you have people in state three, they're going to cycle. And when most clinicians, most psychiatrists hear anything about cycling between hyper and hypoarousal, the bipolar diagnosis comes out. And the number of people that I've seen that have had that diagnosis that didn't have bipolar, right? I mean, they, they have trauma-based cycling. And I'm not talking about bipolar one. I'm not talking about, you know, true mania. When that kicks in, that does seem to be something different. But the, the, the creep, of the bipolar diagnosis, I think we're, we're talking more about trauma. Okay. And then finally, <laughs> So the difference, yeah. Um, how would you identify the difference between like a true manic state and just that like near overwhelming point where you're in hyper cycling? Um, is it just the existence of trauma in the past? No, no, because a lot of people with bipolar will have trauma in the past, right? Um, ma mania just seems different than than uh, I mean, just the the grandiose thinking, the you know, the like, oh, I'm gonna be like I'm gonna have my own Mary Kay empire. I'm thinking of somebody. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean th that doesn't happen with trauma, right? It, yeah, yeah. The delusional con aspects of it don't kick in with trauma. Yeah, duration. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. 
So let's talk, we're getting to the final phase of the map here, right? So the difference between moderate and severe trauma, right? This is, it's the existence of solution, right? This whole map, which we're, we'll sort of reveal in a second, is, is a solution-based map. So a possible solution that, wor that didn't work, right, is, is state three, right? Versus the complete absence of solution is state four. So for example, you know, the lion comes over, you know, tackles the zebra, and, and if you've ever seen this, it's this amazing thing where this animal that was just running for its life is now just sitting beside the lion, panting. They're both just sitting there, right? And the zebra isn't that badly damaged or anything. It's just stunned, right? It's in state three. And the idea is that, um, the idea is in state three, there's still a possibility of survival, right? If if, the, if there's a lucky break, like, like if, the, if the lion gets distracted somehow, right? Or if the cat that's batting a mouse around just gets bored somehow, right? The idea is that the animal has access to all the hot symptoms, so then it, if, if there's a break in the clouds, it'll take it, right? The hot symptoms will kick in, the anxiety symptoms will kick in, and it'll be out of there, right? But state four happens when the lion picks up the zebra, goes to her den, and there's six other lions, right? So there's no way out. There's no conceivable way out. Right? And if you want to put this in human terms, it's saying that, boy, I had a lot of abuse when I was a kid, but there was grandma's house, and grandma's house was good. I just didn't get there often enough like, to be okay. Right? So I still have trauma, but there, there was a place in my world that was good. Right? I can conceive of it. Versus state four, which is, there's no grandma's house. There's only this reality. There's no way out. Right. So here are state four trauma symptoms. Right. It's, um, so compare these to state three, guys. State three was collapse. It was depressed. It was heavy. It, was, it, felt, it felt bad, right? State four is the absence of sensation. It's the absence of feeling. Right. So this is blank. It's numbness. It's feeling disconnected, spacey, vision changes. Uh, feelings of unreality. This is the most dissociated state that we get to. Right? This is where out-of-body experiences happen. Right? I'll have clients sitting on my couch describing feeling like they're floating above their body and they're looking back. Right? And they can, that's how they remember the event. They're saying like, oh, I, it, that was happening to that poor person in the corner there. It wasn't happening to me. Mm -hmm. So floaty, respite. The, the, the trick about state four, guys, is that it feels like a calm resting place, right? It feels like the eye of a, the quiet, calm eye of a hurricane versus everything else that led you to state four feels like the hurricane, right? So it can be really tricky. People will describe this as like, they'll be talking and feeling things and experiencing sensations and all of a sudden things go just flat, right? Things go very numb and they'll, and if you have them describe it, they'll say, oh, I feel like I'm floating in space or I'm in a black hole, right? There's no sensation here. And they'll like it. They'll enjoy the nothingness of it. Right? So it can be a real tricky thing to say um, to somebody who, you know, lived a childhood in state four. Right? And by the way, I, I'm aware that I'm, you know, we're using these bloody animal examples to, to describe these states. But I will guarantee you, if you are working with an adult that has child abuse, they have a state four place inside of them. They have this, this isolated cave where they went to to be okay and nobody else knows about it and they may not even know about it. Yeah? Can you talk about where um, the self-harm fits in that as like state? Yeah, great question. Where does self-harm fit in? Um, well, self-harm can be a number of different things, right? The, you can, people can be using it to do different things. But my sense is self-harm is more of a state three response, right? So self, so it, again, depends, right? If people are in state four and they want to, for some reason, they want to come out of it, they want to feel something, they can, you know, cut to maybe come out of it. But to, for a lot of people, um, you know, uh, go, going to state four is kind of a goal, right? Um, and believe it or not, suicidality doesn't happen in state four. 
right? Because the system's already taken care of it. Sort of the, the worst, when we're in the worst of trauma, we're not suicidal. It's when we're one step from the worst of trauma, when we're still feeling things and we haven't, our system hasn't established a solution to it, i.e. non-existence, that the system says, oh, I gotta, I gotta find a way out. Right? So, state four is not dual activated, right? State four is just flat out numb. And guys, this is so, I really want you to remember sort of state, this map, state four and state three are really important for the conversation on MDMA that we're gonna have because MDMA is so good with state four, right? Um, it's just, again, it's, it's resourcing, it's, it's saying, oh, let's go to all the places that you're hiding out, experience them with, with a ton of resource, right? As opposed to if you're working without state four, you can do it, right? But it just takes a lot longer. But again, we'll get to that. We'll get. I have a question. Yeah. Um, can people or clients or patients or whatever, I, I work in an eating disorder clinic and see a lot of dissociation with patients, can they just do it on their own yeah. because it's a safe place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question is, well, it's like eating disorders or anything really. Can patients sort of push themselves into, into these places? Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, these are, again, these are, pre look, th this was an event memory thing that happened. The nervous system respond to it, responded to it by going here. But if you went here often enough, you know how to go there, right? I had a, a, a patient who, growing up, she, she would grow up in state three, but you know, it's just a difficult, painful place to be because you're feeling both anxiety and depression. And all she would have to do is, you know, poke her dad a little bit, just get him a little upset and angry. He would blow up, she would go to state four, right? And she was doing this in her adult relationships too. And so when we figured it out, we were like, you just have to stop doing this, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. State four seems to sound a lot like an opiate Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Both state three and state four have, there's endogenous opiates that our system is releasing, right? And it, guys, it's not subtle. It's like, you know, when, when clients are going to this place, they literally, they're sitting up in a chair, having a conversation with you. They may be totally stressed about the, you know, the traffic that it took to get to your office, but then you start talking about the accident nine months ago where three people died, and then all of a sudden they're, I mean, they literally will not be able to keep their eyes open, things like that, right? Um, and the difficulty is that the more people stay, the more somebody grew up here, the less they'll recognize it as something other than their life, right? It's just what, this is, this is what it means to be me, right? Yeah. Um, so I work with individuals that have developmental disabilities mm -hmm. and severe and persistent mental illness. Mm -hmm. How, if at all, does this change with the onset of the developmental disability? Oh boy. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it seems like everything would change. Um, I don't have a good answer for you for that, just because that's not a population that I've worked with. Or, I know MAPS is just starting to work with autistic, autistic adults. adults. Yeah, and I do. I that's work right. Adults, and a lot of them have autism, but yeah. a lot of them have well, old DSM, like mental retardation, uh -huh. on like varying levels. And then to compound that with schizoaffective, mm -hmm. schizophrenia, bipolar, um, and so much trauma. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I can tell you that, I mean, what we're talking about here, specifically just the trauma model, doesn't work with people that have um, psychotic breaks or, you know, sort of that type of hallucinatory experience. All of these, yeah, yes, okay. Um, and it's simply because the brain is sending them signals around threat that, you know, guys, so, so this model that we're talking about, the only way to, that processing happens in this model is when threat is absent, right? If somebody is in an active threat situation, we're not talking about doing trauma therapy with them. We're talking about getting them out of danger, right? And for the, the population we're describing there, if, you're, if your brain is sending you constant signals that you're under threat, your, your nervous system is appropriately not unwinding or inappropriately not unwinding, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And MDMA, I think, is very well known as being a very pro-social drug. And they yeah. do a lot of um, you know, somatic based therapies working with trauma trying to get people into like this left vagal pro-social mm -hmm. activation space. And I'm wondering if you can kind of comment, if you're doing a comment on that, the, the, the pro-social effects of MDMA and its health and process and response. Yeah. Well, again, yeah, we're going to get to the MDMA piece. But um, yeah, being uh, social engagement is one of our main survival mechanisms, right? When, when you're a little baby, like you're looking for mom. You're not going to do it on your little baby power. Okay. So is this where addiction comes in too? Like you want to feel something? I think addiction plays throughout the map, yeah. right? So in other words, you can, it, you know, whether you're, your choice is uppers or downers. Right? You're, I think addiction is fundamentally altering nervous system state. Right? Because, I mean, uh, here. All right, so these states can be just as difficult. There, there are many people that are, would much prefer to be depressed than activated. Right? Even though being activated, being in, in anxiety is actually much, you're much better off. Right? Well, Why are you better off? Simply because working with, par with, with sympathetic responses are much easier than working with parasympathetic responses. Right? So think about sort of there is a limited set of threatening conditions that will create states one and two in, in a system. Right? But there is virtually a, a, lim a limitless, bottomless pit of things that will create dissociation. Right? So you can get dissociation from you know, uh, a, a one-off car accident, or you could have spent like you know five years in Rwanda during the genocide there, right? They they both can look like dissociation. One is a lot deeper than than the other. All right. So guys, are this is, so this is the map. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, be basically, we're having, you're having sort of more mammalian level fight flight responses here, um, and and freeze responses turn on out there. This right, the freeze response only turns on when the active responses don't work. And the fight flight when the others. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So if 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 you guys are getting to this idea that like if you have secure attachment, you're much less likely to be on this map. Yeah, absolutely, right? Social relationship, attachment really mitigates a lot of things that can happen with this map. Yeah? Um, and so the processing of trauma, if someone was in a dangerous state before, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of hearing it's necessary to go back to zero to one, zero is like the zero. Yeah, that's, that's what we're finding. That's what we're finding. All right. Okay, so our... Shorthand for states one and two, hot symptoms, right? Uh, shorthand for states three and four, cold symptoms. Um, and again, hot, if somebody comes into my office and they just, they're loaded up with anxiety, it's good news, <laughs> right? Anxiety is, relatively speaking, a piece of cake to work. Um, again, there's no fragmentation of the psyche, no passive defensive responses, none of that, right? Um, and for the most part, any, anybody that comes out of our training program, they can do, they'll be able to work with really high stress states just fine, right? The, the true sort of difficulty, the art and science of working with trauma shows up down here, right? It shows up when, you know, there are parts uh, that are hidden from people that they don't even know about, that they don't have access to, right? In fact, you'll, we'll get to this in the latter half of the day, but you know, we, we know from research that you know, current modalities that are out there uh, that have been tested, like trauma-focused CBT, EMDR, things like that, they work anywhere from like 18 to 25 percent of the time, right? And what, <laughs> what do you think that means? Uh, you know, mostly, I think they're working up here, right? They're successful 
up here. They're less successful down here. And in fact, EMDR, one of the, you know, the, the, the protocol itself states that if, if your client hits dissociation, you're supposed to back off and resource. I'm not saying every EMDR therapist works that way. There are people really looking to push into working with dissociation with EMDR, but right now the formal protocol is you're supposed to back off when clients hit dissociation, which is to say you really are working with people up here. Right? And that's great. You know, it's like you're, you're, it's a really good stress therapy in, that, in, in our definition. Um, and you will help a lot of people if they really clean out their, their stress responses. If they all they do is clean out their stress responses. Um, but if fundamentally the, the heart of a trauma, if we're talking, again, if we're talking about childhood trauma, we have to go down here to really get true symptom resolution. Right. Um, let's see. Okay, so one last piece here and we'll take a, our first break. And, uh, and bathrooms are just out in the hallway here, okay? Um, okay, so real quick, so this is a solution-based understanding of trauma, right? Which is to say that the presence or absence of a solution determines which ANS state we went into during the actual event. And this, the presence or absence of a solution determines a great deal about how we process trauma now. So for example, states one and two, solutions were there and they worked, even if they created a lot of stress for us, right? State three, solution was kind of there, it was weak, and it didn't work. State four, there's no solution, right? And that's actually how we determine, the, we, we draw the line of what, what is re-traumatizing and what is not, right? So when, in other words, processing here is fine. Processing here, and especially down here, you really want to sort of build in an experience of a solution, meaning if this happened to you tomorrow, how would the same, how would it not be as bad? Right? If people don't have an answer to that, don't process with them. Right? In other words, if it can be just as bad as it was back then, their, their nervous systems are just going to deepen the, um, the trauma responses. Okay. okay, let's take a five to ten minute break and we'll come back.